All right, so if you weren't here this morning, or as I mentioned this morning, you know, we're going through various doctrines, especially since this church is brand new. I'm trying to hit a lot of very fundamental doctrines. But one of the fundamental doctrines is just the fact that we don't believe that as believers we should be worldly or we should be of this world or we should be tied in for this world, that we should be separate from this world, that we should be living a life as a peculiar people, as someone who's different, who's sanctified, who's set apart and not just like everyone else. That is a core doctrine that we believe in here. We're not, this isn't just some social club of a church that we just come to, to to have a little bit of fun, get some laughs, feel good about ourselves, and then go home. This church is a training ground. It's supposed to help to teach and instruct you. It's helped to bring you all together so that everybody can be edified. We can encourage one another so that we can do a lot more and provoke one another into love and to good works. So we can serve God better. And the best way we're going to serve God is with the knowledge, with the truth, with His law, with loving His law, with understanding these doctrines and these commandments and these things that we're teaching. So what I'm getting into, and I'm kind of going to go through these series. Now, this series of sermons are all going to have to do with, um, with issues or topics or doctrines, uh, you know, things of that nature that are expressed or at least visible outwardly. Okay, I'm going to be, in the coming weeks, I'm going to be covering other doctrines that simply have to do more with just what we believe, but we're going to be dealing with a lot of things that, is, that has to do with our outward appearance that set us apart from the world because of what we believe. So this morning I taught, or this afternoon, in the first service, I taught on just gender roles and how if you believe in biblical gender roles, that's automatically going to set you apart from this world. You're going to start being looked upon as a peculiar people, as strange, as different, because, oh, you believe in, that the, you know, in this patriarchy and the, the husband is the head of the household and tells everyone what to do? Yes, I do. Because that's what the Bible teaches. That's what we believe, and that's what I'm teaching, and we're going to be going through various subjects similar to this. So tonight, what I'm going to be teaching on is on clothing and hair. Yes, it's an outward appearance. Now, is this specifically the most important doctrine in the world? No. No, it's not. And actually, if you keep your place here in 1 Corinthians 11, flip over to Matthew 23... Even though it is not the most important doctrine, it is a doctrine nonetheless and is something that is taught in the Bible and we're going to take the time to go over it and learn it and study it and appreciate it and practice it. Because it is in Scripture. It is not the most important thing. That's why my first sermons had to do with salvation and things that are the most important things. But now we're going to go into other things, and this is just one of those. And actually, this ties in well with my first sermon, so I kind of wanted to group this together with the gender roles and the difference in clothing and the way we wear our hair. All are tied in with gender. They're very gender-specific. Um, Matthew 23, look at verse number 25. Of course, in Matthew 23, Jesus is just, he's just going off on the Pharisees. On how wicked. I love this chapter. It's a great chapter. He's just going on and on. You vipers, serpents, you know, whited walls, you sepulchre. You know, he's just going on and on, railing on these Pharisees. And for good reason. They deserved it. But look at verse number 25. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. See, the, the Pharisees had this... Um, this appearance of looking really holy, of looking like, oh, they're the men of God. And we see this today. You see the, the Catholic priests walking around with their, you know, white collar or whatever, turn backwards and walk around, and they love the praise of men, and they love walking around the marketplace and having the uppermost room at feasts, and they like just being looked upon as just, oh, this holy person, because on the outside, that's the appearance they're giving off. That's what they want people to think about them. But on the inside, it's a totally different story. Now that is what's most important, is what's on the inside. Right? You can have a dirty outside or not the best appearance on the outside, but if your inside is good, if your inside is holy, if your inside loves the Lord, you're saved, you know, that is most important. It is. But that is not the only thing that matters. And I'm teaching to a group of people today that are already saved, 
It's a group of, of believers that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Your inside should be good to go. Let's get the outside work done too. Look at what he says here, because he's condemning, saying, look, woe unto you. You may clean the outside, but inside you're full of extortion, you're full of excess, you've got all these problems in your heart. But then he says in verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is, which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Is he saying, don't clean up the outside? He said, no, first, take care of what's on the inside. First, that's most important. What's in your heart? Getting your heart right with God, that matters more. But when you do that, then you're also going to get the outside clean as well. The outside does matter. Not as much as the inside, but it still has a purpose. It still has meaning and still matters. If it didn't matter, then what we read, flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 11, this whole first half of the chapter, then why is it in here? Why is this? Someone explain that to me. Why is the first half of 1 Corinthians 11? Because the second half goes into the communion, the Lord's Supper, you know, all that stuff. But the first half, what is he talking about? He's talking about hair. <coughs> Your average Christian today is going to be like, oh, God doesn't care how I wear my hair. Why do you care? Why do you guys oh, you know, why do you say that women should have long hair and men should have short hair? Because it's what the Bible says. Let's look at this. We will pick this passage apart and just go through it like a Bible study, verse by verse, real briefly, because it's not that difficult to understand. But, and again, just as with Ephesians 5 that we saw earlier today, there is other applications, and there's a lot more truth to this than just the physical hair. There's more going on. Like Ephesians 5, it was more than just husbands and wives. It was also talking about Jesus Christ and the church. There's more truths being presented, more truths being taught. But they go hand in hand. And we're going to see, that again, the reason why I'm doing this this evening is because this chapter goes hand in hand with a lot of the things I was saying already in the first service about, about the, the husband being in charge and the head of the household. And he is the head. And we're going to see that reference here in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's start reading here, pick up in verse number 3, 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. So every man, what, what does he say, his head? It means the boss. Every man in here, you know who your boss is? Jesus Christ. He's your head. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Because obviously Christ is the Son. And that's referring to the Father. The Trinity. Jesus Christ has a head according to this verse. And that head is God. We see a definite three in Scripture. The Bible says these three are one. They're one God. Let's keep going here. I, want, I don't want to get off into that. It's, just, it's, it's all throughout Scripture. We're going to see this over and over again as we go through different Bible studies because it's all throughout Scripture. Verse number four. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, there are people that believe in, in a false doctrine, that believe in what's known as head coverings. And they'll turn to this passage and say, see, because you start reading and it says, okay, every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered. So when they read that, they say, oh, well, if your head's covered, that must mean with a hat. Now, if we didn't read the rest of the passage, I can see where you'd get that. Because it's not very specific. And when you think about covering your head, you probably, your first guess would probably be, well, I'm going to put a hat on, I'm going to cover my head. So you've got people that think that men should not wear a hat, but that the ladies, if they're not covered, then that is a dishonor, that she should uh, uh, have her head covered and wear a hat. So that's why you'll see certain religions will have ladies wearing bonnets, Right? You have a nice lady's hat and they'll go into church and men are not wearing a hat or at least they'll take them off when they go into church. But that's not what this is talking about at all. This actually has nothing to do with wearing of hats and the, the Bible itself defines what it's talking about when it talks about your head being covered. And we even get just a little bit of that from verse number 5 there at the end. It says, 
We'll reread verse number five. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So it's basically saying that if your if your head's not if the woman's head is not covered, it's like she's bald. It's like she's shaven. Why would it be like that if it's if it's only talking about wearing a hat? Well, we'll get into that. There's a much more strong evidence here. Let's keep reading. Verse number six. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. So now it's saying, okay, if a woman doesn't have her head covered, then just shave it all, shave all of her hair off. Let her be shorn. Well, that's pretty strict. Again, if we're just talking about wearing a hat, that seems it just seems a little odd. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, I know we're in a bizarre culture and in a weird world today, but wouldn't you say that even today it would be a shame for a woman to be walking around bald, to have her head just completely shane, sh sh shane, shaven or shorn? I mean, even today, I mean, even the world, right? People, and, and there are, there's some women that undergo, you know, chemotherapy and they have these treatments and it makes their hair fall out. But typically they don't walk around with, with, with their head looking like that. They'll put on a wig. They'll put something else on. Why? Because they feel ashamed. They feel embarrassed to go out looking like that because it's something natural that God has instilled in us. That's right. And again, we'll see that as we keep going here. But he's, so he's saying, look, if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, which it is, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now look at the, dis the difference here, again, between the creation of man in God's image and the woman who is there to glorify the man, who is in help meet for the man. There is a difference there. Verse number eight, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. It means that the woman was created from the man because God took the rib out of Adam and made woman. He didn't make man from the woman. He did it the other way around. That's what that verse is saying. And then it says in verse 10, for this cause ought the woman have power on her head because of the angels. Don't ask me what that verse needs. I still don't know exactly what he's talking about with the angels there. We'll get back to that um, on another day, hopefully soon. Verse number 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now look at verse number 13, judging yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Verse 14, doth not even nature itself teach you. I was just saying it's natural for a woman to kind of feel ashamed or embarrassed when she, when she her head is completely shaven and it doesn't have any hair. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair it is a shame unto him. Now first of all, regardless of what you believe on this covering of the head or uncovering of the head we've got a pretty clear statement right here saying that, hey men it's a shame for you to have long hair. Doesn't even nature tell you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair? And again, that's a true statement too. I can't tell you how many times, you know, as, as an unsaved kid just living in the world, you see guys walking around with long hair and they look like a girl. I'll tell you what, that's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame to look like a sissy. It's a shame to look like a fag. It's a shame to look like just some woman walking down the street when you're actually a man. Right. Why is it a shame? Is it, is it because we look down on women? No, it's because we love women, but we ought to have a difference between women and men. No one wants to be deceived into thinking that you're looking at a woman, you're actually looking at a man. It's weird. And it's a shame. But no, nature does teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. And the Bible is re reiterating that and stating that very clearly. No, it is a shame. But then look at verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. So, so is it a good thing or a bad thing for a woman to have long hair? It's a good thing. 
It's a shame for a man. It's a good thing for a woman. But now we get to just the, the final evidence and proof that we ought to need for any understanding of this passage because it defines for her hair is given her for a covering. All those passages that we're looking at being covered, being uncovered, men's hair being not covered, or men's head not being covered, woman's head being covered, and you see covering, 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 and then it's just, boom, verse number 15, the woman's hair is her covering. So every time you see the word covered, covering, being mentioned in this passage, it's talking about hair. That's why the references to being shaven or shorn are in there. That's why it's talking about a man having long hair is a shame and is a glory for a woman, because every time it's mentioning covering, it's your hair. And notice the difference between men and women. The Bible says that man was made in the image of God, therefore he should not have his head covered, meaning not have long hair. So does God have long hair? Did Jesus have long hair according to this passage? Absolutely not. I'll tell you what, those, those portraits that you see of like a face that's supposed to be Jesus Christ, that was not made by someone that was around when Jesus Christ was walking on this. So just so you know, I mean, in case you're, you thought that maybe like it survived the past 2,000 years and that he took a, a portrait and, and, you know, that's really his face with like the, the glowing and, and everything else and the really long hair. He, he didn't sit for that portrait, okay? Because that's not him. That's not what he looked like. Especially when it's like a white Jesus or a black Jesus, because Jesus Christ was of the seed and lineage of David. He's a Jew, so he's going to look like a Jewish person. But it's funny what people will, will buy into and believe, and, and he didn't have long hair, and he looked just like everybody else. That's why they had to have Judas go and, and give him a kiss to identify who Jesus was, because he looked like a normal guy. He didn't have the halo glowing around his head. He was a normal guy. He was a man. And he didn't have long hair. And, we, and men, no man ought to have long hair either. It's a shame. But again, in today's world, that, that's going to make us peculiar. Oh, why do you, you think God cares about how long my hair is? We just read 15 verses talking about men and women's head being covered or uncovered. And one of them is a shame and one of them isn't. So yeah, you know what? God does care. Now, is this found all throughout the Bible? No, but do we need it everywhere? Or is half of a chapter enough for us to say, you know what? It's mentioned. It's important enough to God. We're going to believe it. We're going to accept it. But you know what? People who don't want to accept this teaching... It's because they don't recognize the authority of their head. It is. And for men, that head is God. And, all, and for women, that, that authority is going to be their, man, their husband. It's going to be the man. And I know this isn't popular, and it's not preached often enough, unfortunately, because there's also a generation where, you know, the... Ladies tend to get a lot shorter haircuts as they get older. My grandparents had short hair, my grandmothers. But if we look at the Bible, there's nothing that says that it's okay when you get older. It's not. The same rules apply. Now, I don't preach this intentionally to, you know, offend anybody in particular. But it needs to be preached very clearly. Because it is from the Bible, and we don't want to be deceiving ourselves. And if, if there's anyone that this applies to, I don't think there's anyone here that this applies to anyways, but if there's anyone that this does apply to, you know what? Just get it right with God. Just get right. It shouldn't be that difficult. Don't be too stubborn and kick against the pricks and not want to accept just what the Bible says. I've known people, you know what, and praise God for this too. Some people will say, oh, you shouldn't even preach that because they'll say, and they'll, they'll, they want to jump all the way down, skip all the rest of the verses and jump down to verse number 16. And it says, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So they say, see, so you shouldn't even bother people. About, you know, if, if anyone, you know, we shouldn't fight about it. You know, well, we're not contentious. We're just preaching the word of of God. But they want to point to this verse and try to nullify all the rest of the verses before that. It's not the case. I've seen multiple people, actually men specifically, come into church 
Their heart was right with God, but they were ignorant. For whatever reason, maybe they, they passed over the passage or thought they had a, you know, some type of an excuse for it. But when they hear the preaching, I've seen multiple men get right with God and immediately just go and get a haircut. Praise God for that. That's a sign of someone who actually cares about what the Bible says. And that's the attitude that we ought to have regardless of what the topic is. When you find yourself in error in some way, something comes up in a sermon, something comes up in your Bible reading, and you see something, you go, oh man, you know what, I'm actually doing this. Instead of getting all haughty, I'm, I'm not going to change, I don't need to come, God doesn't care what my hair is like. You just humble yourself and be like, well, there it is. God's not going to change, so maybe I should change. God hasn't changed his opinion of this. Maybe I'll get right. Now, notice that the hair has to do with the authority structure that God has ordained. And that's also why you find that those, you know, the loud mouth feminists, the ones that are making the most noise out of, oh, these men and this patriarchy and the ones that are out there just, just with their loud mouth, obnoxious, you know, bullhorn or whatever, they're going to be the ones that have the shortest haircuts. Why? Because they don't respect the authority that God has given. All of them. I mean, I have not seen one. I have not seen one woman with long hair that's given her to, for a glory unto her just stand up and be all loud and obnoxious for this feminist movement. I haven't seen one. They all are like bull dykes. And they've got that short haircut. And if you're a godly person, you ought not want to even be mistaken for one of those people. We want to be different. We want to look different. It's also obvious that the men with long hair are generally known to rebel against their authority. Right? And the Bible says the head of the man is God. Well, isn't it interesting how in the world, what is the culture of rock and roll? Isn't the culture of rock and roll rebellion? I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Rebelling against the man and against authority and against government and against rules and against everything. And it's all just about partying and having fun and doing what I want and whatever feels good. That's what rock and roll is all about. That is the spirit of rock and roll. So it should be no wonder that we see all of these male rock stars all with long hair. All of them. Why? Because it's that spirit of rebellion and they're rebelling against their head. Look, I know all about it because I was into all those glam bands and the metal bands of the 80s and 90s or whatever. They all have that long hair because they don't care about the authority of God. It's rebellion. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Again, you know, the sermon goes hand in hand with the, with the one earlier today because it does have to do a lot with gender, but I'm focusing more specifically on our outward appearance, one in the hair. Now, that passage is enough. We're not going to a whole bunch of different passages about, the, um, about your hair length or your hairstyle or things like that. There's one more here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 we're going to look at for women more, but, um, but that's enough. And that's clear enough. And we don't need to jump around and prove it ten times from the Bible uh, about our hair length. But we're also going to be talking about the, how we dress. Because, yes, that does also matter to the Lord. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9. The Bible reads, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, there's a lot of things we could go into in this passage. I'm not going to go into all of them. But notice, first of all, what matters the most is, is emphasized here is what's on the inside. 
He's saying that you shouldn't be so concerned about the, the broided hair and spending all this time on your hair and, and getting it all super perfect and really nice and spending time and money getting your hair broided and gold and pearls and costly array and just dressing up the outside of, of just these jewels and things that you're going to put on. But rather, what God really wants you to do is, it says, which becometh women professing godliness. You want to be a godly woman. You want to be a righteous woman. Don't worry about that stuff, but worry about having the good works. Because that's what comes from within. That comes from the person from within. And then it says, of course, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. In verse number 9, notice it also it says that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, modesty, generally what we think of, if you're going to say a woman needs to dress modestly, the first thing that would probably come to your mind is referring to maybe how low cut of, of a garment she has on her top, whether it be a dress or a shirt or whatever, or how tight fitting it is. And yes, that is... Um, those things can be considered immodest. But the word modesty itself is really just referring to anything that's going to draw attention to yourself. So it's more encompassing. When, when, when a woman's shirt is cut really low, what does that do? It draws the eyes of a lot of men. Look, it's going to happen. And you can't just say that, oh, well, they shouldn't be looking. Yeah, they shouldn't be looking, but you know what? You shouldn't be, be offering it up either. Because that's immodest. Because what's it going to do? If you know you're going to draw attention to yourself, then don't do it. And I'll tell you right now, maybe you didn't know, you, it will. Okay, now you know. <laughs> I don't think you needed me to teach you that. You should know that. You probably learned from a young age that, that, that you will get a lot of eyes on you, ladies, the way that you dress. And, and when you start dropping that line and, and, and exposing a lot more of your skin... In any direction, that's going to be getting a lot more immodest, a lot more eyes on you, becoming more of a focal point and center of attention. And that's not the way that God wants you to be adorned. He wants you to be modest. But that's also why it says here, you know, not to have the broided hair and the gold and pearls and costly array. Because there's other ways that you can dress that are still immodest, even though maybe you're completely covered. So how about wearing just a bunch of real fancy, sparkly jewelry and things that are going to get more eyes upon you? That is also immodest. And, you know, maybe that doesn't get preached as much as it should, but, but it's true. You know, you, you shouldn't be spending all this time in front of a mirror every single day. Now, I'm not saying go out and look like a slob. Of course, you care about your appearance in general. But if you're spending, you know, two hours getting ready for the day and, and looking in front of a mirror and you're spending, you know, five minutes in your Bible, you got a problem. Because you're focused way more on your outward appearance than you are on what's on the inside. And yeah, I know, you know what? This isn't the world's attitude. This isn't the way that the world views things. The world's going to tell you, go ahead, dress how you want. What, didn't they have, what was it called, a slut walk or something? A year or two ago, or however long ago that was. And that's, that's what the world promotes. The world said, oh, you should be able to dress like a hooker, and no one should even look at you. You know, just, they're, they're doing this in order to get attention. Because they want you not to pay attention, supposedly. No, that's not their true intent. They know what it does. They know that there's an attire of the harlot. And actually, while we're on this, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 7. That just kind of fits in perfectly with where we're at in the sermon. Proverbs chapter 7. Even the Bible tells us that there is an attire of an harlot. There are clothing that are known that, that prostitutes and whores wear. And it's well known. And we see some of the attributes of the harlot in Proverbs chapter 7. Look at verse number 10 in Proverbs 7. The Bible reads, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Do you remember when we read this morning is that, the, the, that God holds precious the, uh, it's of high value the women who have a, a meek and a quiet spirit? 
This is the exact opposite. She is loud. She's stubborn. Her feet abide not in her, house, in her house. She's not a keeper at home. She's not doing what she's supposed to do. She's loud. She's stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. This is the adulterous woman. This is the, 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 the woman that, it doesn't even say she is a harlot. It says she's wearing the attire of a harlot. You say, you may not be a hooker. You may not be a prostitute, but you could dress like one. You could be loud and stubborn like one. And that's wicked. And then this woman was wicked. She was an adulterous woman and she's lying in wait just to commit adultery and to defile innocent people. It's wicked. So, you know what? Yeah, the way that you dress, it does matter to God. And it matters to other people for that matter. You know, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. We're supposed to be examples of what a Christian should be. What type of example are you setting forth when you step out of your door every day? When you go out into the world? Are you drawing attention to yourself? Are you being immodest? Do you look like a whore? We believe in being a peculiar people, and that's definitely going to make you different the way that you dress. Now, you don't have to, you know... You can wear modest clothing and not look like you're necessarily from the 50s. All right? Styles change. I get that. You, you don't have to, in your zeal to become righteous, look that much different. Because I'll tell you what, when you start looking way different, you're going to get eyes upon you anyways. You want to be able to blend in, but blend in a way that you're still being modest, still covering yourself. You're not, you know, exposing your nakedness. You're not, um, you know, dressed like a hooker, but you can, you can still wear clothing that, that you'd fit in with anyone else, just like Jesus did when he was with his disciples and they didn't know which one he was. He just kind of fit in. He just looked like a normal guy. And we can look like normal people yet still adhere to what the Bible says as what we should, what we should wear. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I put this in my notes because I would have forgotten about this. But I have in my notes, park it on mod modesty. Because this is important. And especially now where we're at in the Atlanta, Georgia area, it gets pretty hot and it's in the middle of summer right now. And it's, it's amazing to me that even in the world's eyes, we live, we live in a world where it is totally acceptable for a woman to go down to a, to a lake or a swimming pool and wear nothing but a bikini and that's fine. But if a woman were to just wear her underwear, just a, a bra and underwear, and just go out to the grocery store, that would be totally unacceptable. What's the difference? Is it just because there's a body of water around? Is that what... It, so if you went to a grocery store that had a swimming pool, then I assume it would just be fine? It makes no sense. And I'll tell you what, it would be inappropriate to go to the grocery store in your underwear. But it's also inappropriate to go around a body of water in your underwear or in a, in a, in a two-piece bathing suit that, that's like your underwear. It's just as inappropriate. Just because the world is accepting of that doesn't make it any less appropriate. Any less inappropriate. Excuse me. Turn if you go to Isaiah 47. I'm going to define this for you. Say, Pastor Brother, what are you talking about? Why, why do you believe that? Well, the Bible defines what nakedness is. It gives us the answer. And, and exposing our nakedness is always associated with shame. Just as, and, and it's natural. It's natural for a person to be ashamed when you're out in public or when you're visible by other people and you're exposed. That's why you don't generally see, I mean, as the world gets worse and worse, we'll probably see more and more of it, but generally you don't see women going out in public just wearing their underwear. No, I know in San Francisco they've got, they've got all kinds of weird perversion over there. 
And I think, they, didn't they make it legal for guys to just be nude? Like in the streets or something? It's like really bizarre. I read that somewhere. I don't know if that's true or not, but it was just like, you know, God just needs to rain fire and brimstone down and destroy that wicked place. I swear, I think that's what's going on there. I don't know for a fact, but I thought I read that somewhere. But either way, there's still a level of shame. Why? Because it's a shame to have your nakedness exposed. And when you're dressed in almost nothing, your nakedness is exposed. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be almost nothing. Isaiah 47, look at verse number 2. We wear clothing in order to cover our nakedness. It's one of the primary functions of clothing. And there's also protection and other things from the elements that we receive. But we, we definitely want to cover our nakedness. That's what Adam and Eve were doing in the Garden of Eden. They are trying to cover their nakedness. As soon as they received the knowledge of good and evil, what did they want to do? Well, they realized, hey, we're naked. I'm ashamed of being naked, so I'm going to try to cover up. That's what they did. Other than that, they didn't even need clothing. But they wanted to put some on to cover up their nakedness, to cover their shame. Isaiah 47, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the river. So he's talking about like fording a river, going through the river. He, so he's, he's saying, you uncover the locks, you make bare the leg. You uncover the thigh. Pass over the river. So look at verse number 3. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Turn, if you would, to Exodus 28. We're going to see basically the same thing. We're going to see two places in Scripture where, when it talks about here, it got, you make bare the leg, and then you get up to the thighs, and that's talking about your nakedness. And in the Bible, the Bible describes you being naked as your thighs being exposed. You don't have to go all the way up to the waist. Because where do your thighs start? Your thighs start right above your knees. I mean, that's where your thighs start. And when you start exposing your thighs, you're exposing your nakedness. We're going to see another example of this in Exodus 28. Just so you know, I'm not just making this up or I'm not trying to yank it out of context or try to apply it in a way that doesn't make sense. We're going to see another witness of this in Exodus 28. Exodus 28, verse number 41. The Bible reads, And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons. And this is what it's talking about, the, the priest's garments. Right? God had designed for what he wanted the priests to wear when they're doing the service of the Lord in the tabernacle. So he's talking about the priest's garment. He says, Thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Verse number 42, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. So the reason why he's making them breeches is to cover their nakedness. And where is it? How long does it have to be in order to cover their nakedness? From their loins, right at their waist, down to their thighs. It covers, that whole element covers the nakedness. So when you go out in public and you're wearing the short shorts or the short skirts or whatever, you know what? Just because your private parts are covered doesn't mean you're still not exposing your nakedness, according to the Bible. And the Bible says it's a shame. Verse number 43, And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. Now, the other thing I want to point out in this chapter, because we're going to get into the difference here, besides talking about modesty or um, you know exposing nakedness, but keep that in mind, because we're going to be shifting gears here, keep that in mind on exposing your nakedness, especially in the... In the, in the hot part of summer. You may be tempted to want to take off more clothing. But as a believer, as someone who believes God's word, let's, let's do it lawfully according to God's word. Let's not expose our nakedness. You want to feel a little bit a little more cool from, from the heat of the summer? Fine. But, but do so in, in, a, in a respectful manner to God's word. But what we also see in Exodus 28 is that he's making garments, he's making clothing for the priests, and the priests are always men. And this is the part that covers his lower portion. And what does he make for him? He makes 
It says that you say, well, it says breaches. It's the same thing. It's called britches. You might know it more commonly as britches. Britches are pants. It's just an old spelling of the same word because that's what that word is. He made pants from. Now, these pants didn't go like my pants go all the way down to my ankles, my feet. Their pants only had to go down to their knees, but it's still the same type of garment. They still had two leg holes that they put in. Their britches, their pants. This is what men wear in the Bible, and it's actually spelled out. And I know this is going to amaze you, especially after this, this, the first sermon today, but God made a difference between men and women. God made us different. He wants men to be masculine and women to be feminine. And not only does He want us to be different in how we act, not only does He have different jobs for us to perform, not only does He care about how a man wears his hair and how a woman wears her hair, He also cares about how we dress. He wants men and women to be dressed different. It's not, you don't just identify them based on their hair. It's also based on how you dress. Deuteronomy 22.5, very famous verse. Hopefully you know this very well. Deuteronomy 22.5 says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. It's a very powerful verse. And again, this is not something that needs to be mentioned over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture in order to be true. You get one very clear, solid verse in God's law that says God hates cross-dressing. I mean, how many times should God have to even mention, I don't like cross-dressing? I think one is enough. I know we're getting really weird today, but that's still pretty bizarre. But what we have to also make sure that we are understanding or we have right and that we have right with God is identifying what is a man's garment and what is a woman's garment. Because the world's trying to teach you all kinds of different things about this. They're always trying to blend the lines and blur the lines and, and make women's hair as short as possible and make men's hair as long as possible and, and get women wearing men's clothing and men wearing women's clothing and try to do it subtly so that you don't realize what's going on. Because ultimately, Satan is in charge of this world and he hates God's word. But I'm just going to come out very bluntly and very clearly. I, as we see in Exodus 28, I like to try to prove everything I believe, and I think I'm doing that with some of the Scripture. God made men to wear pants, that that would be considered a man's garment, and that being a man's garment is not a woman's garment. And yet, you won't hear this in very many churches, but... I do believe that it's wrong for women to wear pants, just as much as I believe it's wrong for men to wear skirts or dresses. It's funny because the world doesn't seem to have too much of a problem stating that a skirt or a dress is a woman's, a woman's piece of clothing. That's still pretty tightly held as being, yep, that's, that would be, a man would be cross-dressing if he wore a dress. Absolutely. Well, tell me, what does a woman have to wear in order to be cross-dressing? People have a hard time saying that. Well, they have to wear a suit like I'm wearing. Because, you know, they make suits for women. They make pants for women. They make everything that a man wears for women. So what, so what is it then? Do you think God actually changes his opinion on what a woman's wearing based on what the culture finds acceptable? Because I'll tell you this much, just as I mentioned earlier today, as much as this generation and, and in the, just in the past couple decades, things have changed so rapidly for the worse. Even when it comes to dress standards, things that, were, that are acceptable today were not acceptable 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Things have been changing. And oftentimes it happens slow, but it's just picked up so much recently that we can't base our morality based on what the world thinks about things at any given moment. I got this article, and I'm going to close on this. I got this article from the Huffington Post. Okay, not, not a conservative website, for those of you familiar with the Huffington Post. Very liberal, okay. But, and they made this article, and, and I guess I didn't get the, uh, the title of it. It's from February this year. It's current. 
and they go back into some of the history of women's clothing. And I'm hoping that this will leave an impression with you. I've done sermons in the past, you know, at Word of Truth Baptist Church on, on proving many, many times over from Scripture women's clothing, men's clothing, all the gender role differences, how God wants us to be different. But I think we can actually learn a lot, and hopefully this will sink in just from this worldly article, and you think about what's written here in light of the Bible. And when you start thinking about, well, how is God really thinking about as, as time progresses, as now you can look back and see the progression of just what women wore as clothing over the past few decades or even hundred centuries? And what is God thinking in heaven? Is this abomination? Because remember, Deuteronomy 22.5 says that all that do so, all that you know, woman that wears a man's garment, a man that wears a woman's garment, are abomination unto the Lord. That word is not used lightly. It's not used frequently. Abomination is a strong word. It means very much hated. It's hated. God, God loathes when this happens. He's up in heaven. He looks out and he sees it and, and that just really burns him up. It's an abomination to God. He hates to see that. Now, do you want to be on, uh, one of the people that God looks at and God's just really angry with because you're totally disobeying his commandment here and it's abominable? I, w I don't want to be like that. Hopefully you don't want to be like that too. And maybe you've been guilty of this in the past or, or, or whatever. Look, get it right today. Just decide, you know what, I don't want to be in Bible. I don't even want to test the waters. And I'll tell you what, I don't know. You know. People ask, well, what's the difference between long hair and short hair? Is it your shoulders? Is it your ears? And they, you know, I don't know. I don't know where God holds that difference, but I don't want to have to find out. I don't want to get as close as possible to say, well, now it's long, now it's short. I think there's a reason why God doesn't tell us that in the Bible, because he doesn't want people getting, just trying to find that exact number, that exact length. That's why I'm, like, I'm already in need of a haircut. I need to find my, my razor. It's packed in a box somewhere and I can't find it. I've been I was trying to look for it yesterday because I don't, I don't want to find out. And I'm not saying I have like real long hair that it just has to be cut, but I like keeping it short. And you know what? And there's nothing, you know what, men, if you have a men's haircut, you know what it is. It's short. You're not wearing like the mullet or anything. You know, you're not getting into some weird, crazy hairdos. I'm looking around today. Everyone looks fine. You know, it's not, and I'm not trying to be the hair police. I'm just saying, you know, people look pretty normal here. Um, but I don't want to find out where that, where that barrier is. And as a woman, you know, you shouldn't want to try to find out, well, how short can I have it and still be considered long hair? You know, when the Bible says it's a blessing, it's a, it's, it's a glory for you, do you why, why would you want less glory? I mean, it's a glory for you. Just, just let you, you know, the, the hair that God wants you to have, let it be glorious. It's good. But I'm going to start reading from this, this article in the Huffington Post. And you'll notice a lot of the themes are going to cross over to what we've already read and established in the Bible. Remember with the hair thing, it was the authority structure. And it always boils down to the authority. To this, this not wanting to have an authority over you when, when people are wrong. Either way, men and women, they just don't want to have someone telling them what to do. Whether it's a man or whether it's God. They just don't like that. It rubs them the wrong way. They want to do what they want to do. And that's why they just go and do this. And you'll notice that that's the same type of an attitude coming out of this article. And I didn't have to pick through a bunch of different articles to find this one because this fits my point perfectly. You know what? You could find any of them. This is the first one I looked at. I was actually trying to find a name. And, and you'll get the name in just a minute. But this article had the name of the person I was looking for. So I'm going to read this for you from the Huffington Post, February 2018. Retailer Ann Taylor is launching its Pants Are Power campaign on March 1st, which the company says commemorates the evolution of pants, not only in fashion, but as a symbol of equality for women and making the question of who wears the pants in a relationship seem more than metaphorical. Right off the bat in this article, they're telling you women wearing pants is way more than just about fashion. It's about the power structure. 
It's about the authority. It's about who wears the pants in this family. You know why? Because the Bible teaches that men wear the pants and that they're the authority in the house. And what this world's trying to do is turn it upside down its head and say, no, 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 no. The woman has authority in the house. We're going to put the women in pants so that they can say, well, I wear the pants in this family. And it's more than just a metaphor. As this article just so bluntly states, they're not hiding the agenda at all. This is the agenda. Now, they were hiding it years ago because it wouldn't have been acceptable back then. And for many people, it wasn't acceptable. And praise God, for many people, it still isn't acceptable today. But by and large, the world bought into it hook, line, and sinker because they're rejecting God more and more every day. Let's keep reading. I'm going to keep reading this article. Of course, women wearing pants is only newly socially acceptable in, in parentheses, in a society controlled by the patriarchy. So again, you, you hear the, the contempt of the authority of man in this article just, just right off the bat. And th even this will tell you, the world will tell you, this is new. Okay, women wearing pants is new. This is, it hasn't been around for a long time. This isn't the way that women have always dressed. This is a new phenomenon. Women wearing men's garments. This is not the way things have always been. This is not the old way. This is a new way of doing things. It says here, Joan of Arc famously cross-dressed wearing men's armor in the 15th century as a deterrent to rape. Yeah, right. And was eventually burned at the stake in part because of this. So you're saying, you know what? They had it right. They said, you know what? You're not going to wear men's clothes. You're not going to go to war. That... Anyway, I'm not going to go off into that. I'm going to keep reading here because that's gonna, that can really go down a rabbit trail. By 1850, so now, now we're going from the 15th century to 1850. We're doing this real brief uh, overview of, of women wearing pants. By 1850, Amelia Bloomer, a women's rights activist, popularized the Bloomer pant. Those baggy knee or ankle length trousers Elizabeth Smith Miller created. So this is when, you know, in the 1800s is when this stuff started to become. But even then, it was, it was still more gradual. Trying, well, let's just make it real baggy and puffy so it still looks more like a skirt or a dress or something that women wear to try to, try to ease it in. In which today, like, there's probably a lot of people that still wouldn't have a problem with that if women wear it because it's just been so long. Now it's been 150 years, 200 years, whatever. But let's keep going. By the 20th century, women's pants were appropriate for occasional dressing only. So it was, it was still being broken in, but it was just very seldomly. Sometimes, okay, you can, you can wear some pants, and it was being more acceptable. Worn at designated times as hostess pajamas or bicycling pant, pants. Bike, bicycling pants. Emma McClendon, associate costume curator at the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, tells Yahoo Lifestyle, by the 1920s and 30s, celebrities like Marlene Dietrich dared to wear full pantsuits to movie premieres. So notice where this is really picking up steam and getting started now is with Hollywood. It's the actresses. It's the people that everyone has their eyes on already. Now they're coming out with, oh, I'm going to wear these pantsuits to these movie premieres. Why? Because there's going to be a lot of cameras there. There's going to be a lot of people watching. Dietrich's uh, came courtesy, I don't know what that is, and the most daring thing about Katherine Hepburn was her pants. That's what this article is stating. Notice the Hollywood influence on the culture. They're, they're giving credit to these Hollywood stars for, for paving the way for women to be empowered by wearing pants, by them being the ones that come out and, and be in the spotlight. McClendon points out that as celebrities, both of those women could get away with wearing androgynous looks without repercussions. So they're saying, because they're movie stars, they could get away with it. They could get away with androgynous looks, meaning neither male nor female. Why? Because they, they want to blur the lines. 
They're going out wearing clothing that's made, that's more, looks more like it's made for men, but it's still kind of fashion towards, you know, they're, they're blurring the lines. They're saying they could get away with it because they're movie stars. It says, while ordinary women elsewhere would have been fined thanks to laws enacted by men. But again, the contempt for men and the authority of men. Yeah, because back then, when Catherine Hepburn was in movies, the culture was different. That's why they're trying to change the culture. The culture was so different that there were laws against it. When men were still in authority and were in charge, they were saying, you know what? No, you're not going to wear this. And if you do, it's going to be a fine because you don't wear men's clothing. Oh, but those men, yeah, they enacted these laws. They're so oppressive. Because they don't want God's judgment upon you. They're trying to look out for you. They're trying to present you holy and without spot and without wrinkle and without blame. As Ephesians 5 says, Oh, but those nasty men. Continuing on here, it says, In France, women needed permission to dress like a man. They put it in quotes. To work or ride bicycles or horses a law that remained intact until 2013. That was news to me. I didn't know there was a law intact for that long, especially in France. It's as though it hadn't been seriously enforced in more than a century. I believe that. It's been on the books. It just hasn't been enforced. But yeah, on the books, it says, yeah, you're dressing like a man when you're wearing pants. Why? Because it's already been recognized as such, even by the world. Yet today, you know, Christians will throw a fit because you say, it is dressing like a man when you wear pants. Why? Because there's so many people guilty of it. That's why. And because they despise the authority and they want to keep doing what they want to do and not have to hear about it and not want to have any problems with it and they have a bad heart. But when we could prove it from Scripture and even prove it from, from the culture. Because look, if it was dressing like a man 100 years ago, then was God against it 100 years ago, but not today? See how silly that is? So then when, when they come out in the next 10 years or next 20 years and men are walking down the catwalks and these, these filthy, perverted fashion designers are saying, hey, look, it's a dress for men. See, you've got a belt and pockets and, and, you know, it comes in camo. It's a man's dress. Now, all of a sudden, God's going to be like, oh, okay, well, it's a man's dress, so I'm not, it's not an abomination. Yeah, right. And it's funny. It's easy to accept that and to laugh about that and say, yeah, Pastor Persons, yeah, how ridiculous is that? But watch out because it's going to come. But people still have a problem with me saying, you know what, pants on women is cross-dressing. They don't see, it's not as clear. Why? Because you've been around it so much and you've been exposed to it so much and it's just gotten so accepted. But it's the same analogy. It's the same thing. A man wearing dress is just as abominable and just as weird as women putting on pants. It is. It's the same thing. And if you don't think so, you've been brainwashed by this culture and by this society. Continuing on here, it says, In 1939, a Los Angeles woman went to jail for wearing slacks to court, the judge citing them as a distraction from the ongoing legal business at hand. That was 1939, less than 100 years ago. In this country, my how things have changed. Women in the United States Congress were barred from wearing pants on the Senate floor until the 1993 Pantsuit Rebellion overturned the archaic rule. Notice, rebellion. Doesn't that seem to be a common theme in this article? Why? Because it's rebellion against the God-ordained authority. That's why. The God-ordained authority of the Bible and the God-ordained authority in men. But that's what happens when you start making women legislatures and usurping the authority over the man, which the Bible says is not for, permitted for them to do. There are different roles. This isn't a value discussion at all. We value women and love women for being women and being feminine, doing what God designed them to do. 
Just as much as we value men and love men for doing the things that God designed men to do. They're different. Almost done here. In the world of fashion with a capital F, meanwhile, this is the name that I was looking for. Ives St. Laurent is perhaps the most notable figure when it comes to liberating women from the confines of a dress. Now, we have a lot of women in, in dresses today. Is it, just, is it just the worst thing in the world? I'm not expecting you to talk and answer, okay? But, but you could answer yourself. Your head. Is it just the worst? Like, oh, I'm so confined in this dress. I just need someone to liberate me. I can't imagine that that's what's going on in your mind. That, that it's, it's, but, I mean, look, this is what the world comes up with. This is what they say. And you know what they had? They had their filthy faggot sodomite, Ives St. Laurent. Yes, he is a sodomite. Is the one who's the most notable figure for getting women in pants. He was known. He just died and went to hell a few years ago. And this is, I was looking up this name because I preached on it a few years ago when he died. It was in the news. And uh, he was known. He, he has like the moniker. He has a nickname. He was known for putting women in pants. That's his claim to fame. And think about that, ladies. The man that's a fashion designer that's known for putting women in pants is a sodomite. He hates God. And that's who's responsible for getting women to accept pants as being acceptable dress. Some God-hating sodomite. But I don't know what I'm talking about, right? McClendon explains it wasn't until the experimental 60s and 70s, because the 60s and 70s, you know, a lot of good, a lot of righteousness came out of the 60s and 70s, right? In American culture. Is, is that what we really look to as, oh man, this is the defining point when we just, just got on fire for serving the Lord? The 60s and 70s, what a great time. It wasn't until the experimental 60s and 70s, yeah, when people were doing a bunch of dope and drugs and fornicating and being hedonistic more than at any other time in this country. Yeah, at this time, we see a watershed moment, a real breaking down in terms of fashion chronology of women's fashion. Ives Saint Laurent deserves a fair amount of credit for continuing to pave the way for women wearing pants for all occasions. With tuxedos for formal wear alongside gowns and women in safari suits. He was revolutionary in that he didn't feminize pants at all. That's why he's revolutionary. Because up to that point, they tried to really make him as feminine as possible and tried to make him look as much like skirts and dresses as possible. But when he came along, he's like, nope, we're not feminizing at all. Just put on a men's clothing. Just put them on. He was significant because he was literally putting women in menswear. This article says it. Presenting different archetypes of masculinity and femininity. <coughs> yeah, he's blurring what's masculine and what's feminine. It's wicked. It's abomination in the sight of God. <coughs> so, if you love God and you want to choose to follow all of His commandments and all of His rules, you will be a peculiar people, especially in today's society. And as I said, we're going to be preaching through more of these types of subjects and topics on being a peculiar people because the world today is going to look at you. They look at my wife. We had, we had so-called Christian neighbors in, in Prescott Valley and this, this is real funny. This was actually the best compliment that I could get as a pastor. Some of our church members were out preaching the gospel at the square in downtown Prescott, and they, uh, they ran across this church group, and um, it, the, our neighbors happened to be there. And they attended the Potter's House, which is a total cult, just a, just a really, really bad church. Pentecostal, believe you can lose your salvation, all this other stuff. But they tried to uphold standards, right? So... I always tried to distance ourselves from them because they would try to hold the similar standards that we would, so I didn't want to be lumped in together with them. So I'd do everything I could to, to separate from any appearance that they would have at all. But what's funny about that is that they would have these standards for men and women's clothing, right? 
Yet these same people that attend that church that have these standards, you know what they complained about to, to my church members that were there? They said, do you know that he makes his daughters wear dresses all the time? Even when they're riding bikes and playing in the yard, they're wearing dresses and skirts? Yeah. You know why? Because it's called conviction. It's because we're not just putting on a show when we go to church. Because we actually believe that it's cross-dressing if I'm not putting them in girls' clothing. I thought that was great. I was like, <laughs> well, praise God, you know. At least they're showing that I'm not just doing a big show. That it's not just in it. I'm just not just in it and just being a big hypocrite and saying, oh, yeah, I believe this and just doing something totally different at home. And you know what? You ought not to either. If you're just coming here to be pretentious and fake and, and just kind of trying to, to, to fit in because you think that you need to fit in here, that's, that's not doing anyone any favors. And, and I'll tell you right now, too, just so, just so you're aware, obviously I'm passionate about this because I'm passionate about the Bible. I love God's Word, and, and I hate abominable things. But you know what? We, don't all, we also don't have rules here. People are going to be at all different levels of their spirituality, and I want to get this clear right now, especially. There's going to be people coming and going through this church. And hopefully we're going to have a lot of new converts coming in and learning and growing. And we're going to have women coming in wearing pants. And we're going to have men coming in with long hair. And you know what I don't want? I don't want everyone just being the police of just saying, you need to do this and you need to do that. I'll take care of it. You, they, you know, oftentimes people don't need to be approached. They just need to hear preaching on it. It'll take care of itself. It'll be fine. Okay, we, don't, we don't need to go inspecting everybody because, look, you don't want to be inspected on all of your sins anyways. Right? People need to be given grace to grow. I'll preach as hard as I can on all this stuff because I believe and I believe it firmly. But we're not, we're not setting up a whole bunch of rules of you can't come into this church unless you do this and this and this and this and this and this and that you have to have everything perfect. It's not the way it's run. And it's not the way this church is going to be run. So it's fine. We're going to show people grace. We're going to let people grow. I, mean, I know firsthand when my wife got saved, we got married not long after she got saved. She'd been saved. She's a newer believer. And I know just firsthand from my own home. I, can't, I couldn't just demand every single thing that I saw that, that maybe she was an error on and, you know, and just say, everything that's needed to change is just starting right now. Just, just everything's different. No, there was, there was a growth period allowed to say, you know, to teach on and to, and to let her come because everybody needs that. Everyone needs a little bit of natural growth time. And you know what? When, when I preach on things, if you are guilty of any of the things that, that I ever preach that's coming from God's word, you know, I'm not upset with you. I'm not mad at you. Just realize this because I don't think anyone has a problem with anything I preach on tonight, but... Just know that if I do preach on something that maybe you're guilty of, if anything, it's just because I love you. It's because I care about you. I want you to get right with God. Or maybe I don't even know that you have that issue. I don't know. Some, there's a lot of times I preach on things that people will tell me later, like, oh, man, were you speaking to me? Like, I had no idea. And I probably won't. That's usually the way it goes. Because I'm not just, just thinking about people going, oh, I need, I need to preach on this and you know, set them right about this or that. That's not the way it works. So... Unless something's just apparent and needs to be addressed, generally speaking, we're going to be preaching through the Bible and people are going to get what they need to hear and you either take it or you don't. But at the end of the day, it's going to be between you and God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction that we get from your words. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to, um, to not be influenced too much by this world, that we can keep our heads grounded and founded in your word, in the truth, dear Lord, and that we'd be able to see through the lies of this world and not be influenced away from, from being in obedience to you, dear Lord, and help us to get the right mindset of what's an abomination according to you and not take all of our cues from the world on what's right and what's wrong. Um, Lord, help us to separate ourselves, help us to have the courage and the strength to make the changes where needed and that we would all have a, a proper, humble, meek heart and spirit to want to be um, just in submission to your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.